Welcome to today's First Friday Forum with the Sheboygan County Chamber of Commerce. We'd like to thank our First Friday Forum sponsor, Prevea Health. Without their support, we could not make this type of event happen. So thank you very much, Prevea. Today, we are going to hear from Adam Payne. He's the Sheboygan County Administrator. As he explains the county, we'll deal with the ARPA funds, or the ARPA funds, and their distribution throughout the county, and then he will answer your questions. So be thinking as he's talking about what questions and follow-up you have and how you might stump him. I'm sure he'll appreciate that. As the Sheboygan County Administrator for 20 years, Adam Payne provides executive management and oversight to all operations of Sheboygan County government. He coordinates and directs um, the administration and management functions of Sheboygan County's 19 departments comprised of 847 employees, 200 programs and services, and an annual budget of $149 million. Adam's responsibilities include developing and recommending organizational, organizational changes, assuring policies enacted by the county board are carried out, and assuring fiscal and program accountability of the services to the taxpayers of Sheboygan County. Outside of work, if he still has some spare time, he's an active member of the Sheboygan Rotary, the Sheboygan County Chamber of Commerce, the Sheboygan County Economic Development Corporation Board of Directors, United Way Board of Directors, and former president of the County Executives and Administrators Association. He also coached youth sports and is an avid outdoorsman and uh, sportsman. So, without further ado, please help me welcoming Adam Payne. Good morning. Good morning. It is a pleasure to be here to talk about the Ryder Cup. <laughs> yes. What a week we had in Sheboygan County. I'm, I'm a, I don't know about you, but I'm still a little bit on a high with how well that went where we not only had one year, but two, two and a half years to plan it. And some of you I know were out there, we were just talking about it over lunch a little bit. Did Sheboygan County shine? So uh, this, this morning, we're very, uh, we're very fortunate to have an, a golf expert in the room, former county board chairperson Tom Wagner is with us this morning. So after this presentation, if anyone has any questions about golf, please ask Tom Wagner. In fact, I'd like to start with just a few quick introductions uh, it's always nice to see some of our county board supervisors attend important functions like this. And at the back table, I have uh, Chair Vern Koch actually couldn't make it today, but Vice Chairman Robert Ziegelbauer. Robert, if you'd please stand and be recognized. I don't know if everyone knows who the Vice Chair is. Tom Wagner, who was our former county board chair four years. Robert Ziegelbauer, I just mentioned. Roger Destrudy, former chair. Thank you for being here. And then Elaine Krause, who is our deputy administrator. So pleased that she's here. And also in the room, just to make sure I don't say anything about the state, is State Representative Terry Van Akron. We appreciate that. Uh, Terry Kotzma. Glad Terry is here. Sorry, Terry. Terry Kotzma is here, member of the Joint Finance Committee. Also here is Tyler Vorpago. Where's Tyler? Is Tyler here? Thank you, Tyler. And then up in the front of the room, another County Board Supervisor, Rebecca Clark, is with us here. So thank you. So I packed the room today with County Board Supervisors and State Legislators. I see Mayor Ryan Sorensen here this morning. And again, I thank you all for taking the time for this today. So I'm going to touch a little bit on the American Rescue Plan Act, what it means for Sheboygan County, why it's so important for Sheboygan County. But before I start on that, I want to set the stage as to why we're even talking about ARPA. And unfortunately, that is because of COVID. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on these statistics. And you all know you can go to our public health website and look at statistics day in and day out. Our public health staff, everyone involved with battling COVID has been so essential to uh, defeating COVID-19 and getting us back to some semblance of normalcy. But the number of deaths a year ago versus today, the activity cases that continue to occur nationally. And then of course, if you look at Sheboygan County, it was really in March of 2020 that we had our first case, our first case in Sheboygan County. We went from zero to three. And throughout the summer, we kept it in the teens. And I thought, all right, maybe we're gonna, maybe we're gonna 
avoid some of this and what's happening, but it tends to come from the south and move its way north. And ultimately, a year later, uh, from March, we are now up to over 600 active cases in Sheboygan County. It, we, have, we had a high of 2,600 active cases last November. So it's gone up and down, but when you look at those active case numbers, is that really the total? Does that really represent how many active cases there are in Sheboygan County? No, it doesn't. Because there's probably two to three times as many people that have gotten COVID and don't report it to public health or aren't followed up with or just uh, stay at home and, and quarantine. So it continues to be a struggle for us. And again, I can't say enough about our public health team. I can't say enough about the county board and the city and the heads of government and their support. And also the Sheboygan County Chamber has been an absolute rock star with helping share information. Our businesses like the Kohler Company, Sargento, so many people have stepped up and are working to be part of the solution and we appreciate that. Next slide, please. The bottom right hand bullet point is the one that concerns me the most and should concern all of us. If our hospitals are overrun and you or a family member is in a car accident or suffers from a heart attack, or whatever it may be, you expect to go to the hospital and get immediate assistance. You expect there to be a bed and staff to care for you. And we have had upwards of over 90% of our ICU beds filled. And that has been going on for a while. I think there are probably people in this community and across the state and nation that aren't going to the hospital because they're just avoiding it, right? So this continues to be an issue, so regardless of how you feel about COVID, whether you've chosen to get vaccinated or not, please know that it's serious. And if nothing else, if our hospitals become overwhelmed, what is that gonna mean for our community? What is that gonna mean for you and your loved ones? Something we should all be mindful of. Next slide, please. Good news, and this is my last slide on COVID and the statistics, but the latest information as of yesterday over 55% of people in Sheboygan County have received at least one shot and vaccinated. You can see the ages, obviously the uh, younger folks haven't been able to do that as long as those of us that are older. I am so encouraged that if you're 50 and older, chances are good you've chosen to get vaccinated. And you can see uh, 55, 72%, 65 and up, 86%. I don't know about you, but my parents taught me that generally it's some of the more experienced people in our lives that tend to have a lot of knowledge and insight and we should learn and listen and uh, you can see that our older generations are leading the charge so hopefully we'll continue to see that number go up and soon perhaps a year from now see COVID as being more in the rearview mirror but it's not going to happen if we don't all pull together okay next slide please so all of this angst and intrepidation sadness, death, all of this has had a tremendous impact on the world and on our nation and on our state and on Sheboygan County. And in March, there was the American Rescue Plan Act that came out and in my career, I've never seen anything quite like it to see this amount of revenue coming to local units of government to respond to COVID. Never seen anything like it. Actually, that, that bio that was read is about three years old now. I'm no longer on the United Way board. I've been here 23 years instead of 20, and four and a half months ago, I became a grandpa. Yay. And that's, that's probably my most important title now. <laughs> but in March of, uh, of 2021, we saw this tremendous influx of resources that went out across the country to local units of government. And as you can see nationally, 1.9 trillion, how much Wisconsin's going to receive. And then Sheboygan County is gonna receive 22.4 million. We've already received half of that. You heard earlier our budget is around $150 million. So this is a significant amount of funds, although in the grand scheme of things, our Health and Human Services Department is about a $35 million department alone. So we're very equipped to deal with this situation and make sure that we make wise, thoughtful investments. But the total allocation countywide amongst all the local units of government is 51 million. 
what an opportunity for us to pull together and leverage resources and help make some good things happen. So as I mentioned, we've already received half the funds. We'll receive the second half sometime next May or June 2022. And we have until December 2024 to make decisions on how to allocate these resources. They must be expended by 2026. So this is not a knee-jerk reaction situation. We can thoughtfully plan and make sure we're getting input and engaging others to make wise, impactful decisions. And that's how Sheboygan County rolls. That's how we get things done. We work together, we collaborate, we make good, thoughtful decisions, and it's one of the reasons why this community is such a wonderful community. Next slide, please. So what can the funds be used for? Obviously supporting the public health response. We continue to fight the good fight, whether it's in our public health department, whether it's clinics, hospitals, what have you. We continue to see people suffering from behavioral health issues, mental health. In fact, domestic violence, sadly, is on the increase. And that's a real concern for our law enforcement and certainly a real concern for families in our community. Covering payroll benefits associated with fighting the fight. So rather than us utilizing our reserves or having to raise property taxes or somehow get more funds from the community as a whole, we have these resource, resources to subsidize these needs and expenses. Next slide, please. Address negative economic impacts. So this is pretty broad. But strictly speaking, just about anything that's been negatively impacted as a result of COVID, whether it's your business, your community, your health, your industry, we have the ability to provide assistance and support, including tourism, travel, hospitality. Pretty broad, a lot of opportunity to do good things here. Next slide, please. Premium pay for essential workers. We could provide all of our public health officers at uh, Health and Human Services additional pay. We could do that. We aren't. Government tends to be pretty conservative, and we have barriers in place, and we aren't in the business, really, of giving significant increases or pay increases. People pull together, they step up, they do what they can to help solve the problem. So we're not using these funds, at least at this point, there has not been any discussion to use this for significant pay increases, premium pay, though, as I'll touch on in a few minutes, we're certainly using it to shore up some areas like staffing at Rocky Knoll. Next slide, please. Replace public sector revenue. I'm very pleased that this was part of it because again, rather than diminishing our reserves or asking property taxpayers to pay more. I mean, I've heard uh, Senator Devin Lemieux and Representative Terry Kotzma and Representative Tyler Gorpagel talk about how proud they are that they built up the rainy day funds. I mean, it was down to nothing there, what, four or five years ago? And they pulled together and helped really build that up. The county's got a pretty nice rainy day fund, too. It's because our county board's conservative and thoughtful, and you want to have those funds when something hits the fan. Fortunately, because of these resources, we haven't had to deplete or diminish our rainy day funds, and we appreciate that. We also have this unique situation that the federal government and the U.S. Treasury's guidance says that what was your average increase in revenue over a period of time? And you can look at that in 2019 and say it was 2 or 3 percent, and after that it's less. You can use the difference, and essentially the county board can utilize these funds to shore up any area they wish. It's really a very flexible tool. But not only did they say how much has it gone up in 2019, you can just use the factor of 4.1%, that if your revenue is going up less than 4.1%, you can use this flexibility to, to offset other expenses in the county. What was, what was the introduction earlier? We have 19 departments, over 200 programs and services, a lot going on. We're gonna have some flexibility to shore up some areas. We're gonna make good use of that. Next slide, please. Water, sewer, broadband infra infrastructure, mayor, uh, Sorensen and I know uh, Administrator Todd Wolf and the Common Council are looking at a pretty extensive water treatment facility improvement in the, in the city. I think 40 million or something like that. I mean, huge, important investment. And if the city wanted to, I think they could use some of these funds 
They could use maybe all of their funds to help with those type of investments. I don't know if they're going to go do so. That's a mayor and city common council decision. But it allows local units of government to invest in water infrastructure improvements, sewer infrastructure improvements, and broadband. And this broadband is really uh, exciting right now. How many of you have the best broadband service ever and it never lets you down? It doesn't matter where you are in the county. I mean, broadband is becoming like a transportation system for agriculture or manufacturing. You've got to have a good transportation system. Like electricity. Better turn on. I think that's where broadband is, or certainly is heading. And fortunately, through the Sheboygan County Economic Development Corporation, the county board and others, we're working with a local company, Bertram, who's already applied for some resources. There are other organizations looking to bring those dollars to our community, and that is an area we can invest in. These are all eligible for the $22.4 million the county received, or the $22 million that the city received, or the $51 million countywide. We could put that all into broadband if we want to. But that's not the plan. Next slide, please. Ineligible uses. We cannot use it just to say, well, we're going to cut property taxes. Uh, you know, we're going to cut them in half next year. Merry Christmas. Uh, we can't use them to say, oh, we're going to give all our employees a nice big pension increase. Can't use it for debt service. Can't use it to build up our rainy day reserves. We can, we're using it to offset using our rainy day reserves, but not to build them up. We need to invest these dollars <coughs> ways that are going to make our community stronger and improve our quality of life and have more people want to live, work, and play in Sheboygan County. Next slide. So how have we started handling this? So we received this news, this U.S. Treasury guidance just touched on that. And by the way, on every one of your tables, there is a summary of six advisory committees that we put together, and I'm going to talk about that more in a minute, and a little background on the county. So feel free to take a copy when you leave today if you want to get into the weeds a little bit more. But as I said earlier, collaboration is absolutely key to our success. That's how we roll. That's how the that's the culture in Sheboygan County, certainly on the county board and department heads with our budget development or whatever it may be. And honestly, I think that's the culture in this community with the Chamber of Commerce or United Way. We pull together, we problem solve, we help make good things happen. So we immediately reached out to our heads of local government, which are the chief elected officials of all the local units of government. We get together a couple times a year, break bread, talk about common interests, and this is when we talked about. We uh, reached out to our Sheboygan County Economic Development Corporation. There are people in this room like Deidre and myself and others that participate on the board of directors or the executive committee, but the SEEDC represents, what, 35, 40 different businesses in our community, including Kohler's, Johnsonville, Sargento, Pillars in our community. Reached out to them. We reached out to the Sheboygan County Chamber, who, as I said earlier, I can't thank Deidre and Mark Shu and your board enough for your support with sharing information about COVID and just helping this community get through this very difficult time. And then United Way. I'm no longer on that board, as I mentioned earlier, but I was for 15, 17 years. Kate Bear is a rock star. That board is so thoughtful, and they help make good things happen. So we reached out to all of them. Next slide, please. And with input, particularly from the SCEDC and the city of Sheboygan, the mayor and the administrator, we put together six task forces. Now these have to look pretty, pretty familiar to you, right? These topics, affordable housing, behavioral health and crisis response, broadband development, child care, transportation, and workforce development. These are topics we've been talking about for years. How long have we been saying we've got 3,000 or more job openings in Sheboygan County? Two decades. Two decades. At least a decade. Okay. <laughs> How long have we been saying we need to invest more in behavioral health, crisis response, affordable housing? How do you get people to move here and work here if there isn't any affordable housing? Or if they ch have children and there's no accessible child care? So, again, the city of Sheboygan, the SCEDC, and Sheboygan County pulled together 
and we established these six task forces. We identified chairs for each one. I'm not going to read all of them, but you can certainly see the names up there and some of the people are in the room. They then helped pull together a team of individuals, and as I said, on your table is a one-page summary of every single one of these task forces. They got kicked off on August 17th. In fact, we just had a check-in meeting with the chairs yesterday. By the end of the year, we're looking forward to them coming to the board, county board, SCEDC, City of Sheboygan, heads of local government, and sharing the recommendations. But I'm really pleased that we have reached out and garnered input and are getting input from the community. Not every county board is doing it this way. Some county boards are just handling it all in-house between the board and the department heads are handling it. So I'm pleased that we're working collaboratively. Next slide, please. As I mentioned, the, the goal is for the chairs of these task forces to provide a report by the end of the year. It doesn't have to be in January. It could be next week if they're ready. But by the end of the year, we're looking for a report with recommendations. And if it's not all completely finalized, that committee can continue working. The key is they're together, they're convened, they're talking, they're problem solving. And of course, the sooner we get these recommendations, the sooner we can start doing something with them and engaging others and establishing priorities and problem solving. Each committee, as you can see from, from uh, those on your, on your table, a charge, objectives, uh, very diverse membership. I mean, we have uh, people from the Kohler Company and Sargento and the Chamber and, and Dietra's chair of one of these committees and uh, just a uh, wonderful group of people that pulled together. And, and when we first did this, it felt a little bit like herding cats, trying to get all these folks quickly pulled together. But then I started thinking about it and the chairs that we have identified. This is what these folks do. I mean, Derek is the head of the Transportation uh, Committee. Derek Mink is the head of Public Transportation at the City of Sheboygan. I mean, this is right in his wheelhouse. And of course he's always talking to others and seeking good ideas and how we can make improvements. Um, we, we've got some really good people involved. We also established an ARPA Grant Oversight Committee. What the heck's that? Well, I've been talking about the county's 22.4 million, or the city's 22 million, or the 51 million countywide when you look at all the local units of government. But you can hardly look at your email and not see the next grant opportunity coming from the state or federal government, right? I mean, not a week goes by, certainly, that you don't see another grant opportunity. So I think it was Louis Gentine, to give credit where credit's due, who said, who's monitoring all this so we're not missing opportunities? And so we listened, and we pulled together a group of some internal county staff that do some grant writing in health and human services or transportation or planning. They're not big picture experts on ARPA, but they have a feel for it. We pulled them together. Ray York from the SEEDC serves on it. And now we have a comprehensive list of every single grant that is coming our way, regardless of who receives the notice. We're throwing it into this comprehensive spreadsheet that now has $3.4 billion of grant opportunities that we can tap into, potentially bring to Sheboygan County to make improvements. So what do you think? You think we're looking for these task force to focus on the 22.4 million the county has? In part. But first and foremost, we want to make sure that we're being mindful of these other state and federal grants that are out there and tapping into those and bringing as much of that home as we can to make investments. That's the first priority. And of course, the sad thing about it is these doggone grant uh, announcements are made and they give you like three weeks to respond. It's just remarkable, I don't get that. I just don't get that, why they have to put such a quick turnaround on it. But fortunately, because we have a lot of good people engaged and a lot of leaders in this community, we will take advantage of some opportunities. I said it before, we want to make wise, impactful investments. I'm at the tail end of my career as county administrator. I'm gonna work here probably for another year or so. And um, just like you, you know, our parents taught you Leave it better than you found it. I see this as an opportunity like I've never seen in my career for us to make some wise, thoughtful investments in our community. We, we haven't had this kind of opportunity 
in my 23 years. So we're going to engage others as we are, and we are going to make a difference. And I know Chairman Koch, if he was here today, because we've talked about it a fair amount, uh, we're both really passionate about the child care area. I mean, all of them are important, but we have to have more accessible child care opportunities, and not just from 9 to 5, right? We have to. In fact, on that note, just as an example, we have a Rocky Knoll Health Care Center. We're, we are one of 34, 35 counties in the state that owns and operates a nursing home. It's a five star quality nursing home. We're struggling with staffing just like everybody. We're the only one in the county that has now an attached child care center. County board just supported that last year, year and a half ago, and it helps with recruitment and retention. So we need to do more of that. Next slide, please. So decision making process. So next steps ahead, you're sitting there thinking, well, how do I get my hands on some of that, right? <laughs> How does the process work? Well, we have essentially two processes in play, and they're, again, right in the county board's wheelhouse. This is how we roll. One is the annual county board budget development process. Everyone in, in the county has an opportunity to get their fingerprints on it, suggest ideas. It's very collaborative. Bill Gehring is the chair of our finance committee, does a nice job. But again, our executive finance committees, they really help lead that charge. All proposals come in from departments and liaison committees. They're all reviewed by myself and the finance director. They're considered by at least the finance and the executive committee, and they go on to the board. So we can build some, and we've already built in a few into our annual budget process, but just a few initiatives, because again, this is so early, and we're waiting to hear more from these task forces. But that's one route, and every year we have an annual budget process. In fact, uh, Deidre uh, and the um, chamber board seek some assistance from the county for the good work that the chamber does, as does the SCEDC, and I'm pleased to share, Deidre didn't, didn't know this yet, just this week the Finance Committee unanimously supported the chamber's request as well as the SCEDC's request. So there is there's strong synergy and support there. Next slide. And then if you're coming in from one of the task forces, that again will be reviewed by myself, finance director, other key staff. We try to Make sure you know it's well prepared and thoughtful and that questions are answered. And then that too will go on to executive finance committees to the county board. But with the ARPA requests, as I said, we want to collaborate with the city of Sheboygan. We want to co collaborate with the SEDC because the more we can leverage resources, if the city comes in and says, I'll put a million toward that, and the county does, and the SEDC does, or you know, some businesses like Sargento or Kohler for child care. The odds of that going forward are so much greater. So we're looking for those opportunities. Goes through our liaison committees, refer to the board, and the, once again, the county board is the final decision maker. Next slide. Other initiatives in progress, and I'm, I've got like two slides left here, and we'll open it up to questions. Um, the county board, just about three months ago, we were contacted by Discover Wisconsin. One of the things we can use ARPA funds for is marketing the area, workforce development, bringing more attention to the job openings we have here, the wonderful quality of life we have here. And so, to the county board's credit, to the city common council's credit, and Mayor Sorensen, and to the SCEDC's credit, all three entities pulled together and are all taking a piece of that responsibility to fund this initiative. So that's in place. Rocky Knoll, out of our 19 departments, this is probably the department I'm most concerned about right now. Why do you think that might be? What's, hap what's happening in healthcare right now? Staffing. Healthcare professionals are burning out. My wife's one. My daughters both work in healthcare. I hear the stories. They're burning out. And right now, I don't think there's a nursing home in our county that isn't struggling to keep staff. It's been a grueling year and a half. And for all of us who have felt it one way or the other, I think of healthcare workers who are in the direct, direct line of fire, holding the hands of people that have passed away and the family can't even be there. there there's example, example after example. But Rocky Knoll right now is struggling with staffing. And if you don't have staff at your nursing home, you can't take care of your residents. That concerns me and should concern all of us. 
So the county board, finance committee just this week and, and the, the weeks prior to this have supported additional resources to help um, plug some financial holes there. Our census is way down, so our revenue is way down, but we still have to maintain staff. New recruitment and retention opportunities for our staff. We, we trained like 24 CNAs over the last couple of years, and many of them went to the hospital. Why? We learned that the hospitals provide tuition reimbursement. So if you want to go from being a CNA to a nurse, hmm, good move, right? We weren't doing that at Rocky Mill. We're going to be going forward. We're going to raise their minimum wage from $16 to $17 an hour. $17 an hour to do peri care, which if you're not sure what that is, that's wiping rear ends and some of the work that none of us care to do unless maybe it's our own grandchild. $17 an hour is the minimum wage. I can go to Sargento or Master Galley, Gallery and make over $20 an hour standing in the cheese line. Child care. Rebecca was sharing with me as we were uh, talking just before this. She worked at the YMCA in Stevens Point, what, I won't say how many years ago. <laughs> and she said she was making $7.89 or thereabouts, eight bucks an hour providing child care. And I said, well, it must be over 10 now. She said, no, it's, it's essentially the, exactly the same. What, where are our priorities? We've got, we've got to change this model. And we're, we're going to, in part, start with Rocky Knoll, and certainly we want to work with others as well. We're using some of these funds for ongoing personal protective equipment, cleaning, and supplies. We continue to do a lot of that, not only in county government, but th throughout every business, I think, knows that. We're increasing our judicial assistance. We have five circuit court judges. They've run behind in court cases and delivering justice. So we're going to provide them with additional assistance so they can catch up. We're looking to enhance mobile crisis services, our Health and Human Services, Matt Stripmotter, the police chief for the city. They've had some discussions with us on some opportunities there, so we're looking in that, we're exploring that. And then if you're not certain, there are federal reporting requirements. So anything we do, let's say it's a county that isn't transparent or isn't working with others, and how are they going to use this funds? I presume our state legislators think about that a little bit. How is that county or that community going to use those funds? Because there's always bad actors. There's always someone out there who screws up, right? Well, the federal government does have re reporting requirements on how these dollars are spent, and I'm glad it's there. That's an important checks and balance to make sure, again, people are making wise, thoughtful investments. Next slide. So with that, how am I doing on time? Okay. So let's just open it up to any questions you have, and, and I'm okay with Stump, the county administrator, because I'll be the first to admit I don't have all the answers, but there are a lot of good people in the room that may be able to help me. But whether it's COVID, whether it's the American Rescue Funds, whether it's county government as a whole, um, Ryder Cup, Tom Wagner's here, as I said, uh, you name it, but fire away. Any, any questions for me? Roger. Thank you, Adam. Uh, Something that might need some clarification is the uh, the health care and uh, uh, the uh, child care at Rocky Knoll. That's not county owned or operated. Maybe you should explain that to the group and and how that might fit for other large companies to do something like that as well. Appreciate that question. Excellent clarification. County government is not looking to get larger. County government cannot afford to get larger. For the last 10, 12 years, our average property tax levy increase has been 1.2%, 1.2, 1 1.3, something like that. I mean, very frugal. And we're not looking to add staff. However, we are looking to problem solve and meet needs. So at Rocky Knoll, when we established this child care facility, we found unused space or underutilized space. We, the county board invested. We remodeled it because we had to for a child care setting. But we are contracting with generations in Plymouth to actually provide the child care. So it's completely run by generations. There's no subsidy from the county for running it. We just provided the space. And first and foremost, our employees get first kick at an opportunity. And again, it's been helpful. We can, we can see the impact it's having on employees who have children there and how much they appreciate bringing them in and picking them up. And then if there's space, we open it up further. 
But thank you, Roger, for uh, raising that question. Good clarification. We're not looking to add county staff to run these facilities, but we're certainly looking to partner. And with ARPA, uh, Gina and I and Kate Bear were just talking a little bit about the child care, and again, I know Rebecca's on it. I can big picture, I can envision us establishing one or more additional child care centers. I can see that happening. I can envision the county board potentially investing in establishing one or more child care centers. I can envision the county board providing some funds to help with the staff support while they get up and rolling. Because we're not going to hire many people at eight or nine dollars, are we, Rebecca? That's not going to happen. But at some point, it needs to be self-sufficient, and county government is not interested in having those be county employees. Thank you, Roger. Any other questions? Yes? Um, Adam, you had made mention of the um, quick turnaround required for the Badger Bounce Back program grants, those that are coming from the state. Do you have a database of that we, as, as community representatives, could check into? I know, you know oftentimes there's only three or four weeks when a grant is uh, issued uh, for you know that window to respond. Um, I just I want to make sure we don't miss anything. Such a perfect, timely question. Thank you for that. Uh, just yesterday, during our first check-in with all the chairs, we talked about that very issue. So we are going to either include it on our website, or we're going to make sure that it gets out to key partners, such as United Way or the SCEDC, or both. But the key is we want to make sure it gets out there. It's public information. We want people to benefit from it. And so I, I thank you for that. We'll, I think next week we'll be able to trigger a uh, different approach to make sure that it's more broadly distributed. Thank you. Commenting question. Uh, first, a comment, you know, having grown up here, I remember as a kid coming, hearing either it was on shirts or people saying, you're entering Sheboygan County, turn your clocks back 20 years. Um, I have to say it, it, it isn't that way anymore. And, and thanks for your efforts. It's, it's, uh, been a, it, it's been a renaissance, if you will. But as it relates to other counties, do, do you get a feel, you've mentioned, you know, if you make, there's always going to be some maybe that aren't as transparent. In talking with other counties, are they taking the collaborative approach that Sheboygan County is, or are we unique in that sense? Everyone hear the question? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, big picture, I think county government is incredibly thoughtful government, and it's nonpartisan. So we don't spend a lot of time worrying about winners and losers. We focus on problem solving. And it's one of the reasons why I love being a county administrator. County government, there's 72 counties, I think overall they do an excellent job. But of course, everyone's different, different issues, what have you. I was recently at a counties association conference where we talked about this, and I was also at a regional meeting up in Brown County a couple of weeks ago where we talked about this. As far as I know, we're the only county that has established task forces that are partnering with our largest municipality and the Sheboygan County Economic Development Corporation. There may be others, but as far as I know, we're the only one. But are there other counties that are certainly engaging and working with others in collaboration? Absolutely. Absolutely. about broadband. I live in little Elkhart Lake and um, my speed of my Wi-Fi, when I can get it, it depends on how many leaves are coming. So I'm actually looking forward to wi through winter so I can get broadband again. That's crazy. That's just crazy. So my question is, you know, I see this timeline. When can I even hope to get decent uh, Wi-Fi where I live and everywhere else in rural Chippewa County? Everyone hear the question for the most part, when will broadband be more highly available? Um, my answer is I really don't know. I really don't know. Uh, what I can tell you is that a Bertram, which is a local broadband provider in the Random Lake area, has applied for funds, as have at least one other broadband provider, and there are, there are a handful in our community. 
and they're all, it's like spaghetti, right? They work together, yet they're competitors. Uh, when they'll receive the funds, the timeout for the build-out, I don't know. What I can recall Bertram sharing with us is if they're awarded the grant and if everything comes together, I think they were looking at least a year and a half, two year, two year build out. That's my recollection. But I would not hold your breath. But the good news is there's discussions in play. All sorts of consultants are chopping at the bit to tap into these funds. And I really believe in my heart, heart of heart in the next two to three years, it's going to be better than it is today. Yeah, thanks for the question. Rebecca, did you have a question? I'm just curious, Adam, about testing. It seems like for COVID, I've been hearing the school district is having a hard time getting tests. I know it's, I think we started doing community testing again, but is there a shortage and is that a, a financial constraint or is there just no, no testing? I don't think it's a financial constraint because there's all sorts of resources for test kits. I think it's the test kits and the test supplies and those actually, actually administering the testing that's a, that's a struggle right now. I think most people, if you want to get tested, if you're proactive, you know, you, you, gotta, you gotta go after it. Someone's not gonna knock on your door and say, can I test you? You gotta get on the public health website and look, on the, look at the different opportunities. Purveya. You contact Purveya, you probably get in for an appointment within 24 to 48 hours. Aurora the same. We have urgent care. We have Wednesday testing by the uh, National Guard at the Aging and Disability Resource Center. There are opportunities. In fact, you can go to um, Walgreens, if they have them on the shelf, and purchase uh, a test kit. Or sometimes the pharmacist will actually test you right there. But please know there's different types of tests and some are more reliable than others. But if anybody is looking to get tested or you're asked the question, I get asked that question frequently. And because you don't think about it every day, you're like, where do I go? How do I do this? Contact someone at Public Health. Look at the Public Health website, county website, call someone there. They will put you right in the hands or give you guidance on exactly where to go. But you, you gotta be an advocate for yourself got to be an advocate. Don't, don't wait for someone to come knocking at your door to point you. Even, even getting the booster shots, that's all coming up now. Where do I go to get my booster shot? And how does this work in the timing? Or, 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 you're looking, or you're thinking about getting vaccinated. Where do I go? Be an advocate for yourself. Gather information. Talk to your doctor and get it done. Tom. something like that. I mean, it's a more complicated way to do it. But I give Adam a lot of credit, and he knows this. He didn't say that. It was his idea. I know other counties are looking at it and saying, wow, that's really a, a great way to do that. But there's a real challenge to that. But at the end of the day, the risk, I believe, is worth the reward. And the credit starts with Adam and the county board leadership to be willing to spread out that decision making, even though the final authority rests with the county board, these committees are going to be invested, and we know how that works. So I think there's risk here, but I also believe there's greater reward, and Adam didn't say it, but he deserves a lot of the credit for doing it. So just wanted to mention that. That's kind of you. Thank you, Tom. Appreciate it. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes, Miss. Yeah, um, I question and comment on the transportation thing. Um, I no longer work in ER, but I worked in ER for over 20 years. We would see a disproportionate amount of people that would be considered poor, unemployed, whatever. I never yet saw a person that didn't have a car and didn't have a cell phone. So I'm not sure that saying that you can't, they can't afford a vehicle is exactly accurate. And I wonder if it would be better to focus on the temp agencies because so many employers are temp, you know, temp to hire, helping them provide transport. I know some of them do already. Like they'll, they'll, they'll say, we've got all these jobs. If you don't have transport, we can get you there. I believe that would probably be a better focus than some sort of government transportation system because you're helping the employers 
which are these temp agencies, you're helping them directly. And you're helping the, the people that work for them, that they're teaching to their job. I appreciate your comment, and I'm sure Derek Mink does as well. He chairs that task force, and obviously the city provides public transportation. Generally, what I'm hearing from um, major businesses is they're looking for more opportunities for people from the city of Sheboygan or other areas to get to their place of work. You know, how many people have heard, oh, it's such a long drive, or I can't get out to Sargento, I can't get to Master Gallery. It's like, good Lord, really? But if they don't have a vehicle, I get it. Right, and I that's why the temp agencies provide the transportation to get them to the job. I'm glad, I'm glad Derek's here to listen to that because he's hearing your input, so thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? I'm just here to comment on the golf expert had re referenced the risks involved with doing it in this fashion versus you just running, you know, doing the, doing the, the, the task force. What, what, what are the risks? Uh, I, th I think what uh, Supervisor Wagner was getting at is when you engage a lot of people as we have, you raise the bar for expectations and you've asked all these people to spend their time and resources coming together and working on this and how disappointing it would be to come forward with one or more recommendations and they're not supported. So there, there's definitely risk. And then of course, that's their risk. The risk for us is they bring those old recommendations in, let's say there's 30 of them and we can fund 10 then the county board has to establish priorities and who's the bad guy, right? So we, so you stick your neck out and, but I would rather err on the side of engaging people and getting ideas and, and we don't have all the answers. We've got all these wonderful experts around the table who are engaging folks, but that's the risk. We might not be able to meet everyone's expectations. Thank you. Yep. Dirk. Uh, just maybe I'll make a general comment, uh, uh, being a, a task force chair. Um, you know, these issues have been, uh, I, I think, uh, been, a, uh, been a negative in our community for, uh, for many years. And I talk about the transportation uh, item because over the last, you know, two decades, transportation has gone up in, in expense and the providers doing it have decreased. Um, and COVID did not help that at all. You've seen actually uh, Uber drivers go down. You've seen the cost per trip go up. Um, there's been consolidations in the uh, cab services, uh, private companies that once provided accessible handicap uh, transportation. We're down to one private provider in the county right now. Um, so infrastructure for res uh, transit resources have all but decreased over the last couple decades, which puts a lot more demand on uh, what we're doing as a service. Uh, and, and that's evident in, in my 10 years in Sheboygan, our public transit system, Prior to COVID, increased ridership by 54%. That cannot be matched by any other transit agency in the entire state of Wisconsin. So if we look at the need here locally, there is a tremendous need. And the task force has identified, and I gotta say, I've got a passionate group of 15 to 20 individuals that will all stand up and say, we have a disconnect, we have a problem. We've got large employers, we've got locations that are under service, we've got small communities that can't get transportation to and from medical facilities. It's also the elderly too, right? I mean, we have an elderly population that needs to get around, go to the grocery store, and it does help the school district, I yep. think, as well. We, we, we've grown partnerships. We've tried to provide more resources, but unfortunately, we're, we're being hit hard right now with a shortage in labor, so we can't even begin to look at expanding transportation services. But this group of individuals uh, has uh, representatives from universities, large manufacturers, uh, several organizations that we all know in Sheboygan County and not one of them is saying we don't have a transportation problem. So, you know, this group is going to be very valuable. Now, what Adam hasn't stated is that we do have received, uh, we have received separate ARPA funds that were not distributed directly to the city. They were actually separated out for public uh, mass transit purposes. So we have yet another opportunity to use some of these funds to um, enhance and create a better transportation infrastructure. But, you know, Sheboygan County, a great place. I love this place. It is such a great county, but everything is spread out. And we have to look at this as almost like a connect the dots because we don't have everything centrally uh, located in, in an urban setting. We have it situated throughout our county. And that also goes for people and where they live. So this task force, I have the full faith that these individuals are going to stay on well past December 
because this is such a short window and such a large issue that this group wants to stick together. We want to put some solutions together and take a look at a long-term approach, not, not necessarily just to meet uh, Adam's uh, request here for a report in January, but also look at possibly uh, infrastructure improvement that enhances the entire county as a transportation network. Thank you, for Derek. And again, we don't have to actually allocate the resources until December 2024. So we're not in a rush with our contributions. But these other state and federal grants, the better prepared we are, in fact, some that are looking for you to be shovel ready, the better chance we'll bring some forward. One last question, and I'll, I'll close here. Anyone else? Yes, sir. Yeah, just uh, we were earlier we talking about the timelines and kind of structuring 2026, spend the money seems a long time for an act that was created to solve a real urgent need. What what are your goals as far as how soon you'd like to see the money actually utilized versus the deadline? Yeah, everybody hear the question? It is a long time. Generally, we see appropriations from the state or federal government that's a year, right? Maybe two, generally a year, an annual basis. And county budgets are an annual basis. So that this is unique, but what is really gratifying is that for the first time, let's just use the child care for example. Let's say the county board decides to build a child care facility or <sighs> renovate some existing place and turn it into a child care facility. And we are looking to recruit and retain staff and generations or whoever it might be that throws their hat in the ring, the most they can afford under their current model is $9 an hour. And we don't get anyone to apply or very few people. The county board could say, I'll tell you what, we'll take your nine, we'll leverage another two from Sargento, Kohler, Bemis, and Johnsonville because we know they need these, these workers and they're willing to put some skin in the game. So now we're, at, now we're at 11, and then the county will put two more in and you'll be at 13, and now maybe we're getting some people to come, you know, something like that. The time period allows us to invest over a period of years and get something rolling and then once the deadline approaches, we're, we're done and it's gonna to have to be self-sufficient. So in some cases, I love the fact that we can look beyond our nose and make some investments that are gonna last a year or two or three or four. In other cases, it might be just some immediate infrastructure. At Rocky Knoll, we're gonna improve all the uh, uh, heating or air conditioning or something like that so we immediately improve the, the safety and welfare for the residents. That's one and done. That's built into the budget. But in other instances, we might want that time to have a longer expenditure. And we got to track it. I mean, we track it and report on it, and uh, it, it's different. You're right, it's different, but I welcome that challenge. All right. I just want to say thank you for the opportunity. Appreciate the discussion, good questions, and thank you for the very good work that you all do. Thank you.